theyeshiva.net. So it's been a long break, relatively long hiatus, so I want to welcome everybody back. Thank you for joining us, wherever you're joining us from. We are grateful for your presence here, and welcome to one and all. This class has been on Zoom for a long time, since, uh, you know, after the whole corona pandemic. And um, God willing, next week, we're going to begin the women's class live. There's only one challenge. The challenge is that since uh, we interrupted our original live classes after the corona, our shul has, uh, thank God, grown uh, dramatically larger so there's literally a few thousand people that come every single morning to Davin. So the first available slot I got was for Tuesday, 12.45 p.m. That's Tuesday early afternoon. So we'll be doing the class then. Those of you who live in Muncie or around Muncie and you want to attend, it will begin next Tuesday, 12.45 p.m., 24 Shea Road, Tent Gimel. There's many tents, it's like six or seven tents. This is tent Gimel, tent number three. That's where our class will be meeting. At that point, the parking lot will be open because till then the parking lot literally has no place and the tents have no place. They're filled with congregants coming to pray. So again, we begin, God willing, one week next Tuesday, 12.45 p.m. And it will be actually live, not virtual. (laughs) And... uh, Everybody is welcome, whoever lives in the area or around the area, please share this with family or friends. And again, it's 24 Shea Road in Muncie, New York, Tent Gimel. Of course, we will also video it, so if you can't uh, attend physically, you'll be able to watch it, and if the time is not good for you, you'll be able to watch a replay. So this class, today's class, is dedicated by very proud grandparents, in honor of their 11-year-old grandson, David Shloyma Goldman, who is starting Jewish Day School. We want to wish David Shloyma a lot of success this year in this school among all of our children, all of our disciples, and may you, the grandparents, enjoy all of your loved ones and have much nachas from David Shloyma and all of your grandchildren, and your entire family for many long, happy, healthy, prosperous years. And thank you very much, Marina, for your partnership. So let's get right at it. We're going to be learning today a exceptional teaching by somebody known as the Magid of Mizrich. If you'll open your source sheets, you could see immediately the headline is Er Teirah La Rav HaMagid of Mizrich Eiskuf Samach. This is a teaching by the Magad of Mizrich that is in Parshish, it's printed in Parshish Akev, but it really relates to all of the Parshish, all the portions of these weeks, which explore so much the theme of fearing God, Yiris Hashem. It's also very related to this month of Elul and the next month of Tishrei, which focus tremendously on the Malchus accepting, coronating God as king cultivating our Yiris Hashem, our fear and awe of heaven. And this is the topic that we're going to be exploring today. I always like to give a little history just to put people and themes in context. So just a few words about the person who's teaching we're going to be studying today, known as the Magad of Mezrich. The Magad of Mezrich's actual name was Rabbeinu Dovber. Dovber. Mezrich is a city in the Ukraine. This was the city where he settled and lived and where he taught Torah to uh, great, great disciples and students. He was the successor of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov, Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, was the founder of the Hasidic movement, the founder of Chassidus, which revolutionized the landscape of Jewish life and Jewish thought. He was born in 1698, Tofnon Ches, and he passed away Shavuos, 1798. 60. The Baal Shem Tov was born in Elul, the 18th day of Elul, Chai Elul, same day which is the birthday of the Balatanya, the yard center of the Maral of Prague. The Baal Shem Tov passed away Shvu was 1760. For one year, his son, Reb Tzvi, the son of the Baal Shem Tov, 
succeeded his father as a leader. But one year later, Shavuot 1761, Reb Tzvi removed his special white garments that he inherited from his father. He placed it on the Magad of Mizrich, Reb Dov Ber, who was a student of the Baal Shem Tev. And he said, my father told me that the heavenly entourage has been conferred, has uh, went over to you. And that's when the Magad of Mizrich, Magad literally means a preacher, a teacher, a pontificator, from Mizrich became the leader of the young Hasidic movement following his teacher, the great Baal Shem Tev. The Magad led for the next... Twelve years, he passed away, Yutas Kislev Tov Kuf Lamed Gimel, which is the 19th of Kislev, December 1772. We don't know exactly the year he was born. There are many arguments about that, so therefore we don't know the, the age in which he passed away. What we do know is that he was a great, great mind, an exceptionally powerful soul, and a tremendous power of connecting and teaching to students. And some of the greatest minds of Eastern Europe flocked to him to learn from him. And later, after his passing, they became the architects of the various Hasidic branches all over Eastern Europe. Of course, Ukraine, where Mizrich is, but also Poland and Lithuania and Russia and other parts of Eastern Europe. The Magad himself, he's known as the Magad himself, did not write down his teachings his students wrote down his teachings, and there are a few books that compile them. One of them is called Er Torah. This is from that book called Er Torah, The Light of Torah, section Kuf Samach, which is 160. Chapter 160, focusing on Apostolic and Parashas Ekev. Let's dig, let's go right into it. Says the Holy Magad of Mizrich. Mo Hashem shoyel me'imach kiim liyire es Hashem alekecha. This is a verse from Deuteronomy, from the portion of Akev, and a very famous one. Moshe Rabbeinu is speaking to the Jewish people during the last weeks of his life. And he says to them, Va'ata, and now, Ma'ashem alekecha shoyel me'imach. What does God ask of you? Kiyim only liyiris Hashem alekecha. To fear God, your God, your Lord. Now, what's bothering the Magid in this verse, in this Pasuk, that he has to explain anything. It seems to be that Moshe is saying something straightforward. What does God want from you? He wants you to fear Him. He wants you to have awe, respect, and reverence for Hashem and for His will as Moshe continues to go on. But let's take a look for a moment at the grammar, at the style in which this Pasuk is written. Do you see how redundant it is? He says, Ma Hashem alekecha shoyel me'imach, ki im liyira es Hashem alekecha. When it should have said, ki im liyira oisai. What does God ask of you? Only to fear God. But we could have said, what does God ask of you? Only to fear Him. Now in English it's not a big difference. Him and God are both three letters. But in Hebrew it makes a very big difference. Ma Hashem alekecha shoyel me'imach. What does Hashem, your God, ask of you? Ki im only liyira oisai, to fear Him. That would be succinct, brief, concise, and very clear. God asks of you to fear Him. But that's not what Moshe says. Ma Hashem alekecha shoyel me'imach. What does God, your God, ask of you? Ki im liyira es Hashem alekecha. He repeats the whole thing again. He wants you to fear Hashem Elekecha. You just said Hashem Elekecha. What does Hashem Elekecha want from you? Only to fear Him. No, only to fear Hashem Elekecha. And then there is always the word S, which seems superfluous. It could have said, Ki im liyira Hashem Elekecha. So yes, the word S is a frequent word in Chumash, but when it says S, it's significant, it's meaningful, because we could have deleted the S and it still would have made sense. What does God ask of you? Ki im liyira Hashem Elekecha, to fear God. Yuvan al derech mashal, all of this will be understood by way of metaphor. But before he begins the metaphor, he first is going to explain the point that he wants to bring out through the metaphor. And this point is going to be clearer through the metaphor. Yuvan al derech mashal, ritzoy noy loimar, what Moshe really is telling us is something deeper than the literal reading that we employed in order to understand these words. What does he mean when he says, what God wants from you is to fear Hashem, Pirush, it means, 
Kemoy Hayira Shel Hashem Not like everybody learns it, which is the literal reading. What does God ask of you? To fear God. To fear Hashem, your God. Says the Maga, that's not what he's saying. What Hashem asks of you is, Ki im liyira es Hashem alekecha. That your yira, your awe, should be similar to God's awe, to God's fear. <laughs> That's what he's saying. He's not saying only all God wants of you is to fear God. <laughs> That's not what he's saying. Then he could have said, Liyira oisai. He could have taken out the S. He's saying something else. What does Hashem want from you? Li, not to fear Him. Li, li, not only to fear Him, but Liyira es Hashem alekecha. Your yira, your fear, your awe, your reverence, your respect should be es Hashem alekecha, should be the same one like God has. It should be the same type of fear that Hashem has. Kiloimar, meaning. Ki yira stam bnei adam hu yira sa'inash. The ordinary fear of a person is fear of punishment. And that really doesn't amount to much. That really is meaningless in terms of a deep connection and a relationship. He doesn't mean it's meaningless, it's not worth anything. It's sometimes worth a lot, as we will see. But in terms of an ultimate relationship, it's a very impoverished connection. The fear that God has in regard to a person is not the fear of the punishment. The fear of the disconnection. The fear of the dis, the misalignment. The fear of the sin itself. God is always fearful, he says, so to speak. Perhaps the person may lose touch with his or her infinity. The person may engage in a life which disconnects him or her from their ultimate true source of infinite energy. Because of the profound compassion, affection and love towards the person, God is always in a state of, uh, of, of, of awe. And there's a, he says, there's, there's a year, there's a fear. that the person may ruin and deteriorate and not realize who he or she is. Like a father or a mother with a child. A, a, a father is concerned, always concerned for a child. You're always emotionally in tuned with where your child is. The father is concerned, always. It's not... Once a week, once a month, once a year. Parents are always connected to their children. You, 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 you really don't want your child to become sick. To become sick physically, to become sick morally, to become sick spiritually. He doesn't want his child to uh, choose a path that may be disastrous and destructive or to, God forbid, fall ill. This is a metaphor for the fear of Hashem regarding a person, so to speak, which comes from the depth of compassion. So this means, says the Magad, that the two fears are inconsistent with each other. The fear of a regular person is the fear of punishment. I don't want to be punished. The fear of God, he says, is not about punishment, it's the fear of the sin itself. I don't want my child, I don't want my loved one to do something that will detach them from their true power. V'zeu she'amar, now we'll understand what Moshe Rabbeinu is telling the Jewish people. Mo Hashem alekecha shoyel me'imach, what is God asking of you? She'tehe yirish shalcha gamkin me'yirish achet, ki me'yirish Hashem alekecha, she'yehe shavalai. What Hashem is asking of you is not just to fear. What he's asking of you is that your fear should mirror his fear. Your two fears should match each other. Your fear, your year should be like Hashem's fear. It should be Yiris Achet, not Yiris Einash. 
fear of ruining a relationship, not fear of punishment. Your fear should be similar to him. You should be similar to him. That's what the Pasuk is saying. Your yidr should be as Hashem It should reflect the year of Hashem It should mirror the fear of Hashem the year as Hashem Alekha, your year should be as, should be like the one of Hashem Alekha. What does this mean? He begins his metaphor. He, he already said the point, but now he's going to explain. Let us give a metaphor to explain this. A father who cautioned his son, he should not walk around barefoot. This is a place where there are many thorns. And one thorn may find a lodging place in his legs. So the father cautions the child, please don't walk around barefoot. If you walk around barefoot, one of these many thorns might find refuge in your legs. The child is young. He's not mature. So he did not pay attention to what his father was saying. And he walked around barefoot. V'yashav lo'i koitz beraglov. Koitz is a thorn. So a thorn indeed penetrated his legs, his feet. Av shaloi ha'yo ke'ev gadol mizah. And the truth is, the Maggit says, it may have not caused him tremendous hurt or pain. Sometimes a thorn could make you extremely irritated and uncomfortable. But in this case, the thorn did not hurt so badly. So the child wasn't complaining. Ach ha'av ha'yo yare. But his parent was afraid. This thorn can cause an infection. And the leg of the child or the foot of the child can become infected and inflated. Yisnapeach is when something blows up, it becomes inflated. So what did the father do? He took a, a hook, what we would call a tweezer, a pin, something with a sharp point. Vikara habasar. Now the thorn was deeply penetrated. It went in deep. So he had to tear some of the flesh, penetrate some of the flesh around, around the thorn. And he removed the thorn from the foot of his child. When he retrieved the thorn, it was very painful for the child. And he was crying out loud with a bitter, bitter voice. He was crying. He was hurting. It was painful to tweeze, to extract the thorn from within the foot. Acha'ov, but the father, Yedeya, he knows, knowing that the alternative would be far worse. Because to leave the thorn inside the foot would mean that he avoids this temporary pain. But God forbid, it can cause an infection and who knows what type of damage if it's not dealt with. So therefore, knowing that this is critical for the health and the longevity and the well-being of the child, this is, this is, this is a remedy, this is a refuah. He couldn't afford to um, tune in to the, cry, to the cry of the child and just give up what he was doing. It would be like the surgeon who's doing a surgery to save a life or to make somebody's life easier, to remove a dangerous growth or whatever. And then when the surgeon sees blood, the surgeon runs away, he can't see it. That sometimes is more cruel. So the father, even though he cares so much for the child, may give his life for this child, loves this child to pieces, or a mother nonetheless understands that the issue is not taking out the thorn. That's not the problem. The problem is that there's a thorn inside. And therefore, despite the fact that the child is crying, the father removed vehesir hakoitz bekoyach. He removed the thorn by force. The story continues. Another time, next day, they went back to this uh, beautiful location. Ratzahatinik oidle lechyachav. The child wanted to walk again barefoot. Vigar Bayaviv. So his father chastised him. Vigizemalov. Vaimerloi. And he tells this child, Halayata Zoikir Hakeva Yisurim Koshim. Shahoyulakhabasar Sakitsmiraglecha. Don't you remember 
how painful and how agonizing it was for you when I removed the thorn from your feet. So be careful, my dear Ingala, my dear boy, be careful. Please don't go barefoot again in this area. Why? Because if a thorn may, God forbid, penetrate your foot, once again, I'm going to have to remove it and it will be so agonizing. You remember last time how you were crying. Says the Magid Vihine, one second, I have a question. Why doesn't the father caution him about something else? He should dramatize to him the fact that if you go barefoot, the thorn may go into your foot. That's what he should talk about. No, he talks about the pain of removing the thorn that the child remembers from last time. Why don't you talk about the actual danger? If you go out, the thorn is going to go into you. The answer is, because the child doesn't care about that. That's not going to be a deterrent factor. <laughs> You're not going to deter him. You'll tell him, if you go out, the thorn is going to go into you. Okay, he doesn't have the awareness, the understanding why he should be afraid of that. So that doesn't mean anything to him. What pained the child primarily was not the thorn going in. It was the thorn going out. <laughs> Extracting the thorn is what was painful for him. So the father dramatizes for the child that aspect that will be relatable to him, that he will be able to appreciate and understand, and that is the pain of taking that tweezer or taking that pin or taking that needle and cutting through and extracting the thorn, that pain the child vividly understands and comprehends, that's what the father talks about because he wants to avoid the child from getting to that state. For the father, it's different. His main concern is not taking out the thorn. His main concern is leaving the, leaving the thorn inside. What he's concerned is that the thorn is going to go in and create the damage that it may da- create. But that's not what he's going to talk about with his child, even though that's what he's thinking about. What he's going to talk about and dramatize for his child is the pain of extracting the thorn. Why? Again, because for him, the practical result is the most important. I don't need you to understand it the way I understand it. I just need you not to go barefoot. I just don't want you to suffer. But in truth, the father is completely not concerned about the extraction of the thorn. That's actually the best part of it, because that's going to heal him. So what this means is that the fear of the father and the fear of the child are completely not the same. The fear of the child is, my tati once again is going to get those tweezers and poke me to get that thorn out. And if it's very deep, it may be very, very painful. That's what I'm afraid of. That's why I'm not going to go out barefoot. The father's perspective, yes, that's painful, and it hurts him and it bothers him. But that's actually the good part, because if the thorn is inside, it's far much, it's far worse to leave it there. What bothers the father? What is he concerned about? Not taking out the thorn, but rather the thorn going in, because that's not good. It's not the way it should be. It's a foreign... It's a foreign substance penetrating the foot. And if it's left there, God forbid, it can cause an infection and have negative consequences. This is the metaphor of the Magid. Says the Magid, And now we'll understand clearly the message. Often, the fear of a person may come from the punishment, not from the disconnection itself, not the fear of the sin itself. From Hashem's perspective, so to speak, he's afraid, he's pained, from the sin itself. has to be 
from the punishment that comes afterwards, that doesn't that doesn't fear him, that doesn't strike fear into him. Ki adirab, on the contrary, zahu rachmanusa, urufuasa yizbarach. This is coming from compassion, from the desire to heal them. Ki ma'anisha bechdei latarim me'avoyne, because if there's a thorn in me, I have to extract it. So the consequence is there in order to cleanse the person from, from what he or she has to be cleansed. V'zehu sh'amar, this is, why Moshe Rabbeinu says to the Jewish people, Ma Hashem alakecha shayel me'imach kim liyiris Hashem alakecha. What is Hashem asking of you? Shatiya yiroscha ki yirosa yizbarech. That your year, your fear should reflect his fear as explained. What is the Maga teaching us? We speak a lot about yiras Hashem, fear of God. Yir Shamayim, fear of heaven. In fact, it's one of the mitzvahs. One of the mitzvahs is the mitzvah to love God, the mitzvah to fear God. As Hashem Tira. Also in the book of Dvarim, it's a mitzvah to fear God. But what does this fear mean? So the Magid opens us up to two possible interpretations. The first one, he says, exists. Sometimes it's important. But ultimately, it's a neklum. It's not very significant. It's not very mature. It's very primitive. It's very underdeveloped. It's not really what the relationship is like. God is begging you to graduate from that fear to the next fear, to the next level of fear. The first level of fear is pushed, afraid of punishment. A person is aware that there's a God in the world, that we're accountable, that good deeds have consequences, that bad deeds have consequences. So a person is afraid of the punishment. That's what it is. It would be like the child who's afraid if I get a thorn into my foot or if I do something else which may be fun and exciting. But as a result of that, there will be later pain when my father tries to extract the thorn. That's what I'm worried about. The thorn itself cutting into my foot, that doesn't bother me. The fact that if it stays inside, it can infect me, that doesn't bother me. I'm unaware of it. What I'm aware of is one thing and one thing only, and that is when it's pulled out, it hurts. Okay, so that's what I have to tell the child. If that's where he is, the bottom line is, I don't want that thorn in your foot. If all I can tell you is it's going to hurt when I take it out, so therefore don't take it in, so be it. But Hashem is asking from a Jew something much deeper. He says, let's try to graduate that. And let's go to a different place of fear. What the father and mother are concerned is not taking out the thorn. <laughs> That's, they, in fact, may take him to the person who will take it out, or they themselves will take it out, as the Magad says. If they're so concerned about it, why are they doing it? I, the child, is screaming, but they understand that this pain is necessary in order to take it out. What bothers them much more, what scares them much more, is the inside infection if it stays inside. What does it mean to fear Hashem? What am I afraid of? Some people say it's, you're afraid of punishment. You want paradise? You're afraid of purgatory? You're afraid of punishments in this world? You're afraid of punishments in the next world? Says the Magad, If that's what you need to motivate you right now not to get thorns into your feet, be, so be it. And we'll congratulate it and we'll respect it and we'll have compassion for it and we'll encourage it. But Moshe says, Ma Hashem Hashem wants something much more. Can I have my fear become more mature and developed where it reflects divine fear? What is this type of fear? Hashem is not worried about taking out the thorn from the person's foot. That's not what he's worried about. He's worried about the infection itself, the thorn itself staying in your foot. What bothers Hashem more than anything else is to be disconnected from somebody that he loves so much. To watch somebody who is so powerful to disconnect themselves from their own infinite potential. To watch somebody unplug themselves from their source of creativity, of life, of divinity, of wholeness, of infinity. From watching your child's posture Instead of it being a channel of infinity, it rather becoming crunched 
and mediocre and lame. That's what concerns him. So Hashem says, it's the sin that concerns me, not the consequence for the sin, not the punishment. The punishment is already the healing. What does punishment mean even? Why do we punish somebody? There's no punishment just in order to punish because I want to flex my muscles or I want to take revenge or I want to show you who's boss. Punishment here means like taking out the thorn, which may be painful. We go through different painful processes in life that open us up. They educate us. They enlighten us. They make us more aware. They help us go back to our pristine self. There's no punishment for the sake of punishment. It's like taking out the thorn. You don't take out the thorn in order to punish your child because he didn't listen to you. You take out the thorn because you don't want the infection. You want to help this child retain his or her perfect health. Be'ezer Hashem Yisbarach. So what concerns Hashem, what fears Hashem is not the punishment. It's the actual sin itself that you should be disconnected, that you should be in a state of illness, in a state of despondency, of depression, of negativity, of toxicity, in which you're misaligned with your true potential source of which you are essentially a reflection. Because the word mitzvah means commandment, but the word mitzvah in Hebrew comes from the word safsa, which means connection. And the word Avera means over, like Mavim Rishus Rishus, you pass, you pass over, like over, you pass from one place to one place. The person through an Avera takes himself, over, Rishus Rishus, Mavim Rishus Rishus, he or she extracts themselves from the domain of infinity, and I go into a place in which I am much more small and stuck. I don't recognize who I am. That's the deepest fear. So what is real Yerushalayim? What does it mean Yerushalayim? I'm afraid to lose such a powerful relationship. This relationship is too good. It's too positive. It's too special. It's too meaningful. It's too inspiring just to be able to allow it to disintegrate. Let's talk about this for a moment in a marriage. Every good marriage must have boundaries and respect. A husband respects a wife, a wife respects a husband. Maimonides quotes the Gemara and it's a halacha in Shulchan Aruch. The sages said that a husband is obligated to love his wife like he loves himself and to respect his wife more than he respects himself. <laughs> this is a statement in the Talmud written almost 1800 years ago, quoted in Maimonides, written 800 years ago, quoted in the Code of Jewish Law, written 500 years ago. <laughs> Beautiful, powerful statement. Love your wife as much as you love yourself and respect your wife more than you respect yourself. But a marriage must have respect. A sense of awe, a sense of reverence. What is this fear from? A person says, you know, I'm not going to betray my spouse. I'm not going to betray my wife. I'm not going to betray my husband. You know why? She may find out. And if she finds out, the punishments are going to be very severe. I'm not going to come home late because she's going to get upset at me. And what's going to happen? What's going to happen is there's going to be consequences. I'm not going to do this or I'm going to do this. Why? Because I want her to reward me. Listen, whatever stops you from doing the wrong thing, kudos, congratulations. <laughs> if something stops you from doing the wrong thing, fine, that's fine. It's perfect. But the ultimate marriage is not a marriage in which I don't betray my spouse because of the consequence of punishment. No, it's because the betrayal itself is what's so painful. Not the punishment. The punishment may be the good part of it. That may be the healing. Your wife found out and the infection came to the surface and now we can deal with it. I know that's the most humiliating and embarrassing, but that's the beginning of healing because that's when you can deal with the crisis. What needs to bother you is that the relationship was ruined, that the relationship was betrayed, that such a powerful connection, so filled with potential and promise, so filled with the potential for such closeness and intimacy and trust and loyalty and dedication and commitment and passion and love and romance, has just been thrown under the bus. That's what I'm afraid of. He says, that's what God is afraid of when it comes to sin. That's Hashem's Yerushalayim which also explains something else. The Talmud says, and the Medrash says, that every mitzvah that we do, Hashem also does. It says in Tehillim 147, we say it every morning, Magid Dvar Rav Yaakov Chukov Mishpat of Yisrael. Hashem shares His own words with Jacob, His own laws and His own statues 
with Yisrael. So the Medrash Rabbah says in Shmois, Lamed, that it's not like God tells us commandments that he doesn't do. No, what he does himself, he tells us to do. And what he tells us to do, he also does. That's why the Gemara says Hashem puts on tefillin. And Hashem keeps Shabbos. Every mitzvah he tells us to do, he also does. So the mitzvah of love, he tells us to love Hashem. How does Hashem fulfill that mitzvah? The answer is, he loves us. Ahafti eschem amar Hashem, I love you. Bonem atem l'ashem alakeichem, you're my children. Me'avas Hashem eschem. God loves us. Baal Shem Tov says God loves every Jew infinitely more than parents love an only child that was born at a time when they thought they won't be able to have a child anymore. But here's the question. How does God fulfill the mitzvah of fear? Yiras Hashem. What is Hashem afraid of? I understand I'm afraid of a lot of things. What is Hashem afraid of? How can he fulfill the mitzvah of Yira? Here we have the answer, which actually the Magid says elsewhere. The Gemara says, Hakel b'day shamayim, chutz mi shamayim. Everything is in the hands of heaven besides fear of heaven, which means everything that happens in my life is orchestrated from above besides the moral choices I make where I have freedom of choice. So everything is in the hands of heaven besides fear of heaven. Fear of heaven is up to me. So Hashem, kevayachol, so to speak, he's afraid what is going to be my next move because this is where I have freedom of choice, where I have to become the author of my own biography. So God, so to speak, is conscientious and very aware and looking every moment at the person, what's going to be your next move because this relationship is so precious, it's so powerful because you are a piece of infinity because you are a divine ambassador in this world, an ambassador of love and light and hope and authenticity and wisdom and healing and redemption. And therefore, every move is so meaningful, every move you make, every breath you take, every gesture, thoughts, words, actions, they have so much power, they have so much meaning, and I know they can either intensify the relationship, they either intensify your life and realign yourself and realign your posture with the posture of infinity so that you become a ladder etched on the ground, but its peak reaches heaven and you become the interlacing link between heaven and earth. You become that ladder that channels the infinite energy and manifests it through you into all the people you're in contact with, beginning with yourself and your spouse and your children and your loved ones and your friends and strangers and everyone you come in contact with. Or he's afraid that you're going to allow a thorn to go into your, to, 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 to your body. And to, to give an example that I think we can all relate to every single day is, you know, sometimes the doctor tells you, don't eat something. This food is not for you. It ever happens. So why will I listen to the doctor? Somebody will listen to the doctor because the doctor says, if you will eat this food, remember last year when you ate this, you ended up in the hospital and you needed a procedure. And you remember two weeks you couldn't function and you were in pain. So therefore you shouldn't eat this food. Okay. But what's really the issue? <laughs> it's not the pain you're going to be when they heal you. The issue is that this food is destroying your life. It's destroying your quality of life. It's destroying the adrenaline flow in your body. It's destroying the chemistry and the integrity and the power that you have inside of you. That's what I'm afraid of. And that's what I want you to be afraid of. Don't focus on the punishment, focus on the relationship. Focus on how powerful this connection is and here I have an opportunity to intensify it or, God forbid, I have an opportunity to ruin the relationship, to ruin the connection. That's what I'm afraid of. I don't want to ruin such a relationship. So God asks the Jew, he begs the Jew, I'm asking you, please, let your Yiras Shamayim evolve. Let it graduate from one state of consciousness and allow it to embrace a much deeper state of consciousness. Grow from a place of yiras ha'inish, fear of punishment, to a place of yiras chait, fear of the sin itself. Why is the sin itself fearful? What if I don't get any punishments? <laughs> Why is the sin itself fearful? What's fearful about it is that I am going to a place in order to numb my pain because I'm unaware of how powerful, of how good, of how holy, of how sacred I am. That's a scary thought, that I have to go to a place of betrayal because I don't feel the power of who I am and the power of this relationship God has with me at every single moment. That's very painful for a spouse. It's very painful for a mother to watch a child 
who doesn't recognize his or her strength, who will allow himself or herself to become sick, who will allow himself or herself to do things that may destroy them. It's very, very painful. It's not about judgment. It's about the pain of it. And that's what fear is. I'm afraid of this. If you want to put it in different words, the fear that the Magad is teaching us here is that when you realize that somebody loves you so deeply, it can get scary. Think about what I'm saying. When I don't believe that somebody really can love me so deeply, it doesn't get scary because you don't owe me anything. I don't owe you anything. You know, we remain somewhat detached. But when you realize at some point in your life how much you're loved, that's a scary thought. <laughs> me? That means you're in a real relationship. That means what you do and say counts. Whatever you do and says counts. That's a scary thought. It's a powerful thought, but it's a scary thought. Scary in a good way. Scary means I'm not a shmata. I'm not a nothing. Your relationship matters to me and it matters to me infinitely. Wow. <laughs> That's heavy. That's what a relationship is. And I'm afraid of letting you down and of letting me down when we have such a relationship. So God is asking us to take it to the next level. Take it to the next level. Let's take some questions. Okay, question number one. In other words, are you telling us that God is <laughs> that God is also suffering with anxiety? What's the difference between fear and anxiety? Or maybe the question is, how can I be fearful in a healthy way without anxiety? In my mind, or in our mind, it sometimes feels like that fear equals anxiety. It's a wonderful, wonderful question and a very important question. I think that this fear that the Magad is teaching us has very little to do with anxiety. Of course, if I'm an anxious person and I'm dealing with anxiety, any type of fear can trigger that anxiety. And it's so important to work on your anxiety. And sometimes you can't do it yourself. Sometimes you need a support system. Sometimes you need great healers, great professionals. But there's a lot to do for anxiety. Sometimes it's difficult. And some of us deal with a lot of anxiety on a constant basis. Let's, let's work on it. But this type of fear, if I may argue, not only does it not induce anxiety, it helps for anxiety. Because we... We hear the word fear. It's like, you know, OMG, <laughs> I'm frightened, I'm afraid. Get me out of this place of fear. We like the word love much more than fear. But he's teaching us here about a very beautiful, if I may say, and a very loving and a very uh, meaningful type of fear, which is very, very much not one associated with anxiety. And I'll say it again. It's the fear of ruining such a powerful relationship. You know what? I wish everybody has that fear, that you're aware of such a powerful relationship that you're in and you're afraid to lose it. I bless you to have this type of fear. It's the best fear to have. It's the best type of fear to have. It's also associated with an awe, a reverence. You know how sometimes you're in awe of something or somebody? It's like, oh, stop with the awe. Let's just do the love. No, 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 no. Wrong. Wrong. Love is about the closeness. Awe is about the wow. This is beyond me. This, this is transcendent. This causes me to melt. This makes me feel very humble. That is such an important ingredient in life. It's such a gift to have in life. That there's certain moments, certain places. I remember the first time I went to the Grand Canyon. I saw the pictures before. But when I, so I thought I know what it looks like. And then when I, when I arrived there with my wife, it was, I don't know, like 20, uh, two decades ago, 20, probably 21 years ago. And I looked at it and I still remember like for 30 seconds, my breath was taken away. I was like, what? like, I just got glued. I, 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 lo I lost my self-consciousness for a few seconds. 
And then I read what Mark Twain wrote, that when God created the Grand Canyon, he did not create the adjectives with which to describe it. When there's no adjectives, there's awe, there's reverence. That's not anxiety. That's deep. That's real. It's like you're in awe of an idea. You're in awe of a person. You're in awe of a concept. You're in awe in the presence of an experience. There's something so powerful here, so intense here. So when we talk about this type of fear, this is the wonderful and beautiful and loving fear that comes from love. When somebody loves me so much and I'm aware of it, it's scary. It's intense. (laughs) It's intense. When we speak about real people, I wanted to say the word tzaddikim, great tzaddikim, but I didn't because we right away disassociate. Oh, those are the tzaddikim, you know, holy people who don't live in this world. When we when we study the lives of real people, we see that they lived with this constantly. Not because they had anxiety, they actually had a calmness. It's the calmness that comes from knowing that you're in a very stable relationship. There's nothing like the calmness when you're in a very stable relationship that you can rely on, you can trust. You know, in a marriage, when a wife knows her husband is there for her a thousand percent, the husband knows the wife is there for him a thousand percent, even if they disagree, but they're here for each other. I am afraid to lose such a relationship. You know what? And if one comment is going to destroy it, I'm not going to say that comment. It's just too precious. My life is too precious for me. I'm afraid to ruin it. I'm afraid to lose it. My child is precious. That's this type of fear. Next question. I'm wondering if all of this is simply to give us an awareness. Hashem is in it with us. All of it. That's comforting maybe. That's also a great point. That Hashem is in it with us. That's an excellent point. And it all boils down to the same core issue. There is a real relationship here. In a real relationship, if I'm in it and you're not in it, something is missing. In a real relationship, I'm in it fully and you're in it fully. doesn't mean I don't make mistakes, but it means that I'm investing my soul, my mind, my heart, my body, my brain into this relationship. And that's his point. Yeah, Hashem is afraid. (laughs) He's afraid. This is his mitzvah of Yeris Hashem. Now you're saying God doesn't fear God. He fears us. That's exactly what he fears. That's also a fear of God because we are manifestations of God. So he's afraid of Hashem. He's afraid of the Hashem in me because there is such a powerful relationship. Next question. In the middle of the teaching, the Maggit says that punishment is really a form of healing. But at the end of the day, the person experiences that healing as punishment and therefore as painful. Is this a game of semantics? If the relationship with Hashem is not about reward and punishment, why couldn't God allow us to experience healing in a less painful manner that does not resemble a punishment? Even if we know it's not a punishment, it still could feel like a punishment. It's a very powerful question you're asking. You're saying at the end of the day, the person is experiencing it as a punishment. So you'll tell me all of these beautiful words about healing and recovery and rehabilitation and removing the thorn and getting rid of the infection, but ultimately it's resembling a punishment. And, you know, I have to say two things about this. First of all, you know, this doesn't answer all of the mysteries of life that as we often talk about transcends our imagination and our understanding. You know, why certain forms of healing look, take certain forms that have to be so painful? It's a great question, and I don't know the answer. I don't know if anybody knows the answer. We say in the, we say in Kippur many times, and in various confessions, you know, You know, cleanse me, blot out the stains, but not through pain and not through illness. That's an important request, but I, I do want to just say one thing because I think this is what the Magad is teaching us here, and that is perspective is so important. Yes, we don't have the answer to all events in our lives and other people's lives and what's going on in the world, especially this week and last week, but uh, perspective is so important. And I think that after th- 
Jews knew this in their DNA, but in the times of the Baal Shem Tev, it became a little bit eclipsed. And this was a major contribution and a major idea in the teachings of the Baal Shem Tev and the Magid and their students. That you have to open your eyes and cleanse your doors of perception. Not to see Judaism as just a continuous exercise in reward and punishment. God punishes me. God is punishing me. God will punish me. But to see it much more in terms of a relationship. This doesn't mean there's no consequences. A relationship has consequences. And if I insult my better half, I need to apologize. I need to say I'm sorry. And there's pain and there's remorse. But the perspective is it's not based on reward and punishment. It's based on a relationship. And that everything that happens in my life is not a punishment in order to punish me. I may be going through pain, but that pain is a form of opening me up to a deeper truth about myself and allowing me to become the person I could become. Now you're asking a great question. Couldn't God have done it in a different way? Can't we take out the thorns without hurting the child? Great question. I don't know the answer to that. He could have done whatever he wanted and this whole idea of pain could have been eliminated at the moment of creation, but it's not. So now the question is, how do I look at it? Do I look at it as, I'm going to get you. God is trying to get me. He's trying to crush me. He's going to show me who's boss. He's going to get me back. He's going to take revenge. You started up with him. He's going to start up with you. So the Maga teaches us, don't look at it that way. Even when you look at punishment, don't look at it that way. Always see life as a continuous opportunity for more healing, for more cleansing, for more enlightenment, for more awareness. This doesn't mean it's not painful. It is, but exercise is also sometimes painful. And stretching is also sometimes painful. And certainly certain procedures are very, could be very painful. And I have to be able to acknowledge the pain. Nobody is saying here that when I extract a thorn, I shouldn't shed a tear with my child because he's crying. And I'm like, if you're, if you're, if you're a healthy, normal mother and father, you don't tell the child, stop crying, I'm trying to heal you. I'm taking out your thorn, you spoiled kid, thank me. Then you need help, you need a lot of help. Of course, as a mother and a father, we all know when the child gets the needle, you empathize and you hug them and you embrace them and you could shed a tear with them. But if it's important to take it out, you're not going to be afraid of the pain. So we can experience the pain and we can cry with the pain. We don't have to be afraid of it. We could look at it and we could say, this is painful, but I'm not running away from it because this is an opportunity for me to learn more, to explore more, to be more, to become more? Very good questions. Next question. Why is it that as much as you talk about love and oneness and closeness to Hashem, it still does not become integrated in my life? It does not blend into me. I still have fear because I see my failures and I see my transgressions. And even though my transgressions are non-intentional, I am still full of fear. It is hard to work on my midas. Why shouldn't I be afraid? Listen, this is why we talk about this. This is why we're teaching it. Because I know that our go-to, our go-to place is often one that does not... Um, that does not develop this type of relationship. We go into a place of anxiety and fear and, and God is going to strike me down and he doesn't like me. And that's why I think it's important to, to change our neural pathways, <laughs> to really meditate on this. It's part of graduating from a gullus consciousness into a gaula consciousness that we often talk about. And that's what the Baal Shem Tov was trying to do. He used to say that Gullus is a state of consciousness, Gula is a state of consciousness. In Gullus state of consciousness, there's natural alienation. In Gula state of consciousness, there is natural oneness, organic oneness. Do we make mistakes? Yes. Do we transgress? Yes. Many of them are unintentional, and I would say today all of them are coming because people don't know their greatness and don't see their depth. And that's exactly what you want to be afraid of. You want to be afraid of not realizing how beautiful and holy and beloved you are. That's the line. You want to be afraid 
of not realizing how beautiful you are. I think that's it. Afraid of, of, of being ignorant emotionally. I don't mean only here, emotionally, viscerally. When I'm ignorant viscerally of who I am, that's the tragedy. We need a better English word for year, a better English translation for year. Okay, I'm open to it. I'm open to it. I, uh, I, 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 I use the word fear, but I just want to tell you intentionally <laughs> because I know how much baggage it comes with, but I think it's important to see how he talks about it. So the same word could be addressed in so many different ways. I could use a different word. We could find a different word, but it's important to go back to that word and see how he defines it. And he sees it as a mitzvah. Moshe is asking the Jewish people that God is begging you. Shoyel mimach, he's begging you. Stop being afraid of punishments. Start being afraid of losing such a powerful relationship. Stop being afraid of punishment. Start being afraid of the sin itself because that's much worse than the punishment. The punishment is really about cleansing. The sin itself is about cutting you off from yourself, from your infinite self, from your divinity. That's what you should be afraid of. Next, next comment. An example of positive anxiety is performance anxiety. People who have it perform better. It comes from understanding the magnitude of what you are doing. Seems to me that this is the type of fear you're talking about. Realizing the magnitude of what you're involved in, of your relationship, creates a very positive form of fear. You may call it anxiety, but this is not an anxiety that debilitates people. It's an anxiety that rehabilitates people. Exactly, because there's two types of anxiety. There's an anxiety which tells you that you're just not good enough. You'll never be good enough. And there's a different type of anxiety. I don't even know if we should use that word because <laughs> it comes with so much uh, you know, negative connotations. But the anxiety you're talking about is an anxiety, basically, it's just a conscientiousness. It's, it's an awareness of how important this moment is. And, and I celebrate that importance. Okay, next question. Somebody once told me that uh, you can explain fear of God in a fire and brimstone manner, fear of punishment, but really it's about losing the relationship. You don't want to lose your connection. But the Magad's explanation makes this explanation bilateral. That is a two-way mirror type of fear. It's much deeper. Not only should we be fearful of harming or losing our relationship with infinity, but Hashem is fearful of losing his relationship with the Jewish people. He's fearful of you sinning because he loves you and he cherishes you and he doesn't want you to lose that connection and he doesn't want to lose it. So when he chose us as Abraham's descendants, he put a lot into us. He gave us his Torah. He tolerated our misdeeds. There's a long-standing relationship and I guess he's also afraid of losing that relationship. Okay, beautiful. Next, the way I see it is people have very narrow perspectives because each of us operates from our, with our own tools. Pain, punishment, negativity, we are afraid. Nobody likes the dentist's drill. But of course, it is tried to say, and it's understanding that God has the widest of perspectives. He knows that what appears to one person as pain or punishment or even negativity may hide a deeper and unrevealed good. He knows that what appears to us as negative in the short run is only from a narrow perspective and it's going to be shown to be positive in the long run when your perspectives are widened. So within our narrow short-term perspective, we look at the world in a certain way and we have a certain trajectory and we define punishment in one way and fear in another way. But God, with his unlimited, long, wide, long-term perspective, wide lens, he doesn't fear the pain, he fears the damage and the loss of the relationship of Anila Daidi Vidaidi Li. Thank you, thank you. This is where Amuna Bitachin trust comes in. Yet, yeah. I'm reminded of a phenomenon that I see in many workplaces. Many employees go to work with a mindset and goal of not getting in trouble from the boss. I don't want to be caught. That becomes their primary focus. Doing the job becomes secondary. It's like students in a school. The main thing is the principal shouldn't caught, caught, catch you. The teacher shouldn't catch you. You come late, but make sure they don't realize it. 
If they would realize that they had the ability to be productive in school and do their job well at work, there's really no need to fear punishment. They should be more bothered by whether or not they're accomplishing their task, not if they're going to be punished or not. If children in school would realize that they can be successful, and this is an amazing experience, what's bothering them is not that they're coming late and they'll be caught, but that they're missing the information so vital to their life. It's like a doctor who practices in fear of getting sued. You're more afraid of getting in trouble than you are of not helping the patient heal. What you're describing is so amazing. It fills me with awe and love. What a blessing. Everybody should hear this and everybody should feel this. Okay. I am afraid that my grandson... Thank you, thank you. That's beautiful. I am afraid my grandson, Ray Seckley, will marry a non-Jewish woman who he is dating. Must I not express my fear because it will call, it will cause me to become detached from him and his parents? Well, generally in life, the important thing is not to be right. The important thing is to be effective. So you always want to figure out what's going to be the most effective way of communication. The fact that we want to express ourselves is amazing. So you need people with whom, to whom you can be very open with. But in terms of education, we always want to ask ourselves, what would be the most effective way of communication and one that brings us closer and bonds us together so that we can be here for each other? That's my very general answer to you. You can email me and we can get more specific because this is a, this is a serious question. My, another question. Maybe instead of feeling uh, fear, maybe you could speak about feeling reverence and respect mixed with wonder. <laughs> great, great. <laughs> I do relate to this teaching because if there's no labor pain, there's no baby. If there's no pregnancy and everything that comes around with, there's no baby. If there's no pain, there's no gold medal. Uh, man earns his bread by the sweat of his brow since the tree of knowledge. And woman bears children by pain. It's part of the system. No pain means bread of shame. Rabbi Akiva longed to be able to give up his life, to love God with all of his soul. Yeah, the question is why the system had to be that way. And ultimately we know that part of Geula is when the two come together, when the ultimate infinite revelation can be integrated fully and we can enjoy it comfortably without the need to sacrifice one for the other. Beautiful, beautiful questions. Thank you. Next question. Such an important discussion. Thank you so much. I'm going to miss this when you move to the new format. Thank you for an incredible year of, lear of learning and growth. Well, I hope you don't say uh, an eternal goodbye to us. Wishing everybody a healthy and wonderful and splendid summer for whatever remains from it. And of course, being the last month of the year, it should be a Shana Tova Umetuka, a good year and a sweet year and a blessed year, Ksiva to each and every single one of you and all of your loved ones, your families and friends and communities among all of our peoples in Israel and the world and among all people in the whole world. It should be a year of true health, happiness, prosperity, only good and positive tidings, a year of of true healing and unity and redemption. Amen. Ken Yehiratzin. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.